Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to the History Center. My name is George. I'm the programs manager here at the History Center, and we're very excited to be hosting tonight's presentation, uh, Read Between the Ravines, An Evening with Ursula Pike. Uh, this presentation is co-sponsored between Lake Forest Library and Lake Bluff Public Library. So before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to both of those organizations for allowing us to host tonight's presentation. I also wanted to mention that this program is also in supplementation of the citywide multi-organizational initiative titled Native Voices. And so about a dozen organizations in the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff area, including Lake Forest College, both libraries, Eloa Farm, Gorton Community Center, Lake Forest Open Lands, and a few others have partnered for the entirety of the year to put on programs focused on Native American culture and Native American history. So this program is part of that initiative. Um, a lot of the other organizations will be hosting programs in supplementation of Native Voices through the end of the year and the History Center included. I'm sure the library, both libraries will be doing uh, Native Voices programming. So keep in touch if you're interested in learning more about Native American history um, through these organizations. The main website for Native Voices is also available on the Lake Forest Open Lands main website if you're looking for more information or for upcoming dates for programs. So with that, it would be my pleasure to introduce uh, the library director over at Lake Bluff Public Library, Brené Grassi. Poso, Sigoli, hello. My name is Renee Grassi and I am the library director at the Lake Bluff Public Library. Tonight is particularly special for me because this is the first Reading Between the Ravines event as a part of the Lake Bluff Library community. Community-wide reading initiatives like Reading Between the Ravines have a measurable impact on the hearts and minds of readers like all of you. These events challenge us to think beyond what we know or what we thought we knew and encourage the learning of new ideas. Library events like the one you're about to attend tonight also helps us broaden our worldview beyond the North Shore and helps us open up to new perspectives. And importantly, community-wide reading events promote and celebrate reading and literature, which is why we're all here tonight. And it brings us together for that common experience. So I'm especially happy and grateful um, and want to say thank you to all the staff at the Lake Bluff Public Library and the Lake Forest Public Library. I want to share my personal thanks for all their hard work and their collaborative spirit to make tonight's event possible. So thank you. Next, it's an honor to introduce Kim Vijou, Executive Director of the Mitchell Museum of the American Indian and our facilitator for tonight's discussion. Kim brings over 20 years of experience working on behalf of many leading tribal organizations, federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, and private sector entities to develop and deliver culturally relevant initiatives and programming designed to improve the well being of Native children, families, and communities. Kim is also the founder of Wolf River Consulting Group and previously served as the Communications Director at the U.S. Department of the Interior's Bureau of Indian Education. Kim is an enrolled member of the Oneida Nation and a descendant of the Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin. She joined the Mitchell Museum in October of 2021, so please let's welcome Kim Vijou. Well, thank you for that introduction, and I want to give Ursula the floor, and I'll give my thoughts about it later, but she's going to share a little bit of the book right now. Thank you for inviting me. This is a, this is a wonderful event, um, and it's so great to hear that it's part of a community-wide um, focus on natives. Uh, I, I love that. Um, and I want to specifically thank the uh, library, the libraries, uh, for Kate, Jillian, and of course Kim for um, inviting me. Uh, and I've really been looking forward to this. Um, so I wrote an Indian among Los Indígenas, a native travel memoir about my experience um, in Bolivia, South America, as a Peace Corps volunteer um, and American Indian. So I'm going to read a little excerpt um, to talk about, to give 
a sense of what Bolivia is like um, and my experience there. Bolivia was isolated, isolated by mountains and expanses of sparsely populated rugged terrain. It was a landlocked country that lost access to the Pacific Ocean in 1904 after a war with Chile. In Bolivia, the Andes Mountains broke into two separate ranges and continued bumping along South America into Chile and Argentina. There were vistas of snow-capped mountains with tranquil llamas silently chewing in the foreground. But Bolivia also had mountains of jagged orange and slate jutting toward the sky. Centuries of wind and rain erosion had revealed layers of red and gray minerals. Roads were built around the treeless steep mountains because there was no going over them. In Potosí, the high-altitude, bone-chilling city whose silver deposits inspired the hot greed of Spaniards, the hard brown shape of Cerro Rico, literally rich mountain, could be seen from every narrow street and open plaza. Bolivia was also home to the world's largest salt flat, Salar de Uyuni, an expanse of horizon-skimming whiteness that stretched for mile after barren mile. An Aymara Indian story explained that the mountains surrounding the salt flat were once giants. One of the giants deserted his wife for another woman while his wife was breastfeeding their child. She cried and cried, and the tears mixed with the milk and ran down her chest in white streams, covering the vast area between them. When it was dry, the sun reflected off the salty whiteness. Skin, Light-skinned tourists were burned to a shade of pink, not unlike the flamingos that flock there to mate every November. During the rainy season, a thin layer of water accumulated on the surface and turned the salt flat into a giant mirror that reflected the sky and erased the horizon. Tourists were drawn to the remoteness, to the myth of Bolivia's savage purity. It let them prove they were travelers and not tourists. Tourists ordered frozen blue drinks from the hotel bar. Travelers, by contrast, rode buses without shocks for 50 cents while suppressing their explosive diarrhea, proving their hardiness. What about the grandmother seated next to the traveler? She'd been riding the same bus for 20 years. The bus was luxurious compared to the back of the truck she had ridden the previous 20 years. Would she see a difference between a traveler and a tourist? Or would she simply see a gringo riding through her country as though it were a roller coaster? The eastern border of Bolivia pressed up against the backside of Brazil. The rivers from that region flowed into the Amazon basin, and the jungles were full of the world's largest rodents, thick vegetation and piranha. By the 1990s, when I was there, the eastern lowlands were one of the poorest regions of Bolivia. Giant cattle ranches with few cattle remained. Many hid processing operations that turned the coca leaves grown nearby into cocaine for North American snorting. We were told it was a dangerous, messy part of the country, thick with yellow fever infected mosquitoes and no volunteers. But the tribes in these lowlands had built causeways that stretched for miles, controlling the water and enabling large communities to exist well before the Spanish showed up. The mountains, the salar, and the thick jungles all made Bolivia a difficult place to explore. The isolation and remoteness helped the Quechua, Aymara, Guarani, and other tribes maintain their culture and language for centuries. Some of the tribes managed to stay hidden until the 20th century, but the riches in the ground itself worked against their efforts. Gold, tin, rubber, mahogany, cocaine, Lithium and even the water drew Westerners who did what they do, explore, infect, desiccate. But those natives were still there, speaking their languages, dancing, and feeding themselves and their children. <laughs> Thank you.
No, I think I think um, I'll hold off, and and if there's opportunity to read later, I sure. So I, I just wanted to start out saying, like I mentioned this earlier, like how much I love this book, and I was like instantly in the even in the first chapter could relate to it almost like I had had not before, and for so many reasons, and I think as a, a native person, we're always written about in the past tense and we are sort of romanticized or written as these like sad downtrodden people <laughs> and rarely from like a, a real perspective and so in, with my like museum hat as a nat native woman working in a native organization i that's like my main goal is to change that that you know kind of starting in a blank canvas and teaching people that native people are still here we still exist, we still thrive, and we have this like we have very unique experiences and very similar experiences to everyone, you know, around us, but we still despite all of that like we still remain mostly invisible. And so this book really takes you out of that like front and center um, as a just as a native person. I, it was so relatable because we, you know, even growing up, I know the genre has grown for Native authors, but <clears throat> we never had books to read about Native people in their, you know, kind of non-reservation, um, urban, suburban experiences, and never anything about our lives beyond, like, the reservation. And so this really takes you, like, way beyond that, and I, I really, like, really enjoyed that and <clears throat> from a personal experience like I also grew up um, in the city and in suburbs and as a young adult like young adult I had a similar experience and kind of had a existential crisis and uh, lived in Africa for a while and I thought that I would be able to go to Africa and it was in South Africa um, was not used to all the race relations there and I thought that I would just kind of float through everything. <laughs> and it was really eye-opening, and it was the first time where I felt um, a little patronizing, and a little, it was, I was very uncomfortable most of the time, in a good, in a good way. Um, and then, you know, th that was very relatable as well. And I also liked how you changed, you really like helped, I think, anyone, native, non-native, anyone who is traveling abroad or into different socioeconomic environments, like to have some compassion and look at things in a, in a much different way. Um, and I know that a lot of friends who've joined the Peace Corps went in thinking that they were gonna save the world and it was a much different experience. So thank you, I really, this is kind of a, kind of a transformative book um, for the Native um, experience. Wonderful. Those are all things that I was trying to get across with the book and so I'm really glad that yeah. you connected with it. So I guess I think we would all want to know this, like what inspired you or what prompted you to write the book? Well, um, there's a quote, I've seen it attributed to different people, but Toni Morrison has uh, said, if there's a book that you want to read but it hasn't been written yet, write it. It's some version of that. And um, and so when I returned from Peace Corps, I kept looking for a book that would help me understand the experience that I had because I knew it was different than those of the other volunteers. Um, and I didn't really ever find any, I, you know, it, there was this website called Peace Corps Writers and I would check it every year and see is there is there a book that's going to help me understand this and it didn't necessarily have to be another native author, I just was hoping maybe an African American who served in Africa or, or someone who had a similar experience um, and I didn't and I didn't see one and so I started working on on this book um, myself. What really helped me too is that I um, worked, I was at the Institute uh, for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. They had just started an MFA program. Most of the instructors were Native and it, they really showed that you could write anything. There were no limits to what you can write as a Native person. Um, you can include your perspective as a Native person on anything and, and that really 
um, propelled me forward to, to finish the book and, and then um, to get it published. Yeah. Um, so when we, I had mentioned like a lot of travel narratives have a tendency to, for, to like as outsiders or voyeurs or um, saviors. <laughs> Um, how, how did that kind of keeping that in mind, how did that shape your, I guess, how did that shape your experience going into the Peace Corps? And then how did that kind of influence what you included in the book? No, that's a great question about thinking about how I thought about it before I went. And, um, you know, I, I, I had a little trouble getting into the Peace Corps. They, um, definitely recruit um, from private institutions. I, I, and um, n my state school that I went to, they had a recruiter, but um, he wasn't really excited about my application. <laughs> and uh, it took um, about 18 months, where other people, it just takes a couple of months. So, so it took a while to get in, and I, I wasn't even sure if they were ever going to invite me. And then when I was invited to Bolivia, I was so excited, because I already knew that it was a uh, indigenous, primarily indigenous country. And so I, I assumed when I went there that I would be able to connect with people, similar to maybe your assumptions about when you were in South mm -hmm. Africa. Um, and that was not the case. Immediately I was, um, I was shown that, that I was not assumed to be a native person. Um, and so that's something that I, uh, I assumed I would have when I got there, and I didn't. And so the whole time I was there, and then the whole book was me kind of grappling with that and figuring out how do I connect with Bolivians. Yeah, and I liked in the book how you you kind of balanced between as a native person, kind of interacting with the Peace Corps administration and vol other volunteers, and hearing things about kind of maybe unintentional or intentional sort of conversations about or comments about Native American people in North America. And then also th those kind of similar feelings towards the indigenous people in, in Bolivia. And so you were like, I think as most Native people face, is like you are constantly nav navigating these like, multiple worlds at all of the same time and um, kind of, you know, that can be exhausting <laughs> sometimes. And I, I really liked how you, you frame that and, and, and mentioned it throughout like the different scenarios that happened in the book. Thank you for noticing that. And I think one thing that um, helped prepare me for that is my mom worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, as a forest manager on several uh, reservations in um, the Pacific Northwest, and I would definitely see those complicated, I, I would see both native and non-native um, Bureau of Indian Affairs staff, the things they would say about the natives that they were working with on their reservation, the frustrations they would feel, even though they were many of, most of them were there to actually assist the tribe, there was um, it wasn't straightforward and uncomplicated assistance. Yeah. Um, do you, um, did you feel like the Bolivians considered you an indigenous person? You know, I, I, when, when the book came out, people were asking me that, and I hadn't ever really thought about it. And, um, and, I think that for the Bolivians, they never, they didn't really, but, but in some ways they did. I think my Bolivian friends are much more comfortable with this um, idea of being part native and something else. Like every single person is part native. Everybody that I know, um, and even if they speak Quechua primarily, um, they also speak Spanish, uh, or maybe even 
um, Aymara, another indigenous language. So I think that to them it wasn't strange that I was part native. They're much more comfortable with that. But um, there would be, there is even a moment in the book where I say, I'm part native, I'm Indian too, and they all just kind of laugh at me. And um, But I think it was, it was um, different than, maybe I was presenting it to them in a different way. Yeah. I, th I think, it, yeah, that's another thing that I think a, a lot of non-native people can go into another country and they are just kind of put into one box. And um, sometimes when native people travel abroad, we, <laughs> we get put into all these, these boxes. So someone in my family is um, Bolivian and did not see me as indigenous at all. And one of the reasons why they said so is because I didn't speak my language. And that was sort of like her reference point for mm -hmm. your identity. Um, and she connected with my mother because my mother was much more, um, you know, she grew up in the culture. And so it was very different dynamic between, between mm -hmm. us. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I, my husband you know, worked in international law enforcement and he worked for Interpol for years and so we were always traveling and moving around and you know anywhere in Africa it doesn't matter if you're native or you explain things you're just uh, like they call me Mazungu or like <laughs> white lady um, and then when like a native person goes to Europe especially Eastern Europe you are just completely admired and romanticized oh. and you know, uh, seen in a completely different way. And so I think travel really opens your eyes to how the world sees um, Native people. And it even makes me think about how we, um, you know, we, are, we have to be so rigid with our enrollment and, um, and how we determine who is and isn't Native. And, um, and that is not the case in Bolivia. Um, and so I think that it, it is eye-opening because it's a completely different approach to indigenous, indigenous identity. Yeah. I also liked how you talked about, uh, you, you had a lot of um, experiences where it made you kind of question what privilege is. And can you talk a little more about that? I think that was really important uh, in, in so many like, things that happened throughout the book. Um, particularly like your experiences in the school? I really felt uncomfortable because I, I definitely did not grow up with um, privilege um, in the U.S. just because of being native and, and being low income. Um, but then in Bolivia, I was... I had privilege just because I was um, an American. And I wasn't the only one. Actually, my husband, who was in Peace Corps also, he grew up um, in Chilton, Wisconsin, and um, lived a very bare-bones existence up there. And he didn't... And, and so for him also to, to f go there and feeling um, like he didn't grow up with any privilege, but to be there and see that he was considered to have privilege, he did have privilege... Um, especially as representatives of the U.S. government, I mean, we had we had privileges and and protections that even if we were there by ourselves, we wouldn't have. Um, and, and so it was something that I struggled with, but that I tried to be conscious of. Um, I mean, I think the whole process of why, why I was there was me recognizing that yes, I had privilege, I have privilege, I need to be responsible with this privilege. When when there was one part in the book that like really, really stuck out for me and it's you were in the school and you had like a moment of pity for one of the students, the boy, and then you realized their situation was not just a kind of a, a like a pity story. They had, they were there for different reasons and, um, and maybe I guess as Americans, we're not there to, to kind of, step in and, and be a savior or fix things. And, you know, even I've, I've been lucky enough to travel quite a bit. And 
I've also done that mm -hmm. and assume like, oh, well, maybe they need something from us or maybe we can, maybe we can help or, um, and as you spend more time with people in different places, you realize, well, maybe they have it right. Maybe this is, maybe this is how we should all be looking at life differently than, you know, sort of we get caught up in things. And, and I, I thought that was so great, especially for people that like, for young people that are maybe interested in the Peace Corps, or a lot of people do like gap years or want to want to travel abroad to to really keep that in mind. That's you know that where you kind of question privilege and then question how um, you know the decisions that people had made. Maybe they weren't so bad. <laughs> there was one specific um, moment where I took these two brothers that they were really. One of them, I think, was six, and the other one was nine, and took them to a store, and I, it was near, right before I was leaving, and I said, oh, get whatever you want, and, and these kids really had almost nothing. I mean, they were at this children's home because they needed support, and um, and one of and the older boy bought shoes. I was like, oh, that's a great choice, and the, other, and the younger boy wanted to get a hat, and I was just thinking you need shoes, you need pants, you need underwear, you need all these things. That's what you should do. But I had said, get whatever you want. And, and he did. And, and I just knew that, you know, it's not, it wasn't my, I know there were kids, but I think that I had seen this play out in other situations. It was not my choice to tell them what they needed. Um, and, you know, I continue to struggle with this because I, not struggle with this, but I've, I've found a way to work um, to be supportive of of Bolivians, I have stayed in touch with um, Teresa, um, the the main woman that I worked mm -hmm. with at the center over the all these years. I've stayed in touch with her, and and you know she's gone through some hard times, and and sometimes I will send her money, and I just it's her decision to do what she wants, and um, and I'm not gonna make her tell me what she spends her money on, you know, that I'm just going to support another human being that, that needs it. I liked how you, you've talked a lot about or shared a lot about how your, your work, your work during your, your Peace Corps time had changed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like with the school, I liked how you sort of went in with a set idea and it ended up being completely different from you know, what you had... I really thought that I would... First of all, I wasn't happy to be sent to a children's home. I have a degree in economics, and I thought, oh, maybe they'll put me working in some important office somewhere, but I actually had worked um, in the daycare center, the child care center at my college, um, and so I had real experience with working with kids, and, and so they put me um, in a children's home helping support like income generating pro projects and um, and I really didn't know how to support them I, I really struggled and felt like I needed to be doing more and but as time went on I realized that I had to just show up and um, and show them that I was there to assist however I could or even with like washing the dishes or whatever I needed to do to connect with them, build a relationship. And then um, eventually this friend of mine, she invited me to help her make bread because at the children's home they would bake bread um, twice a week. And she invited me to help her make bread. And after doing that a little bit, I said, would you help me with a project? And, and she did. She agreed to, to help me make um, these baked goods that we sold. And it was just though a process. I, I, it wasn't, I realized that it wasn't me walking in and saying, here, I'm going to do this and this is how I can help you. It was build a relationship first. Do you feel like the Peace Corps um, trained you for that or prepared you for um, navigating <laughs> life and work and day-to-day -day interaction? Yeah, yeah, you know, I felt like they... Um, it was a short period of time. It was three months. Training is three months. And, you know, there's language and there's some culture. But um, I, I felt like there, there definitely was a sense that, well, 
you know what you're doing. You grew up in the U.S. You can, um, you'll have knowledge that you can impart um, to them. And I, I think that I didn't realize that I was there to to learn as much as I was to serve, or or at least that was how I got through it. So I, I don't I don't know that they did. I think that. Um, Maybe that's changed, mm -hmm. but um, it really was me figuring it out. Um, and I think that's the case with most of us. I mean, most of us were fresh out of college. Mm -hmm. Many had just basically graduated, got on a plane, and gone. So, what would you like? What would you share with someone who's interested in joining the Peace Corps, or interested in like traveling um, abroad or staying someplace? for a kind of a longer period of time. I was really surprised. A lot of recruiters reached out to me um, to talk at different events. And I said, I'm going to be honest about my experience, which wasn't <laughs> perfect. And they said, that's fine. We, you know, we want you to, to tell everybody your story. And what I tell people is what I was just saying about how you are not going there to... Um, to thrust your knowledge upon them. You know, you don't have the answers. You're not going to save anyone. Don't think you're going to save anyone. You are going to learn and respect their full humanity, you know, that they're people too. My daughter is, a, is in college now, and if she is interested in Peace Corps after she graduates, I would encourage her um, to go, but to also remember that she's not going to save anyone. She's going to learn about another culture and about their strengths and and that maybe she can share a little bit about her own. And you've been back to Bolivia since, right? And how do you how would you say Bolivia has changed since your time there? It has changed incredibly actually. I think it was in 2006 they elected their first indigenous leader. Um, and then he was has a lot of issues, Evo Morales does, but he did promote indigenous identity. Um, he, you know, in the schools now, kids learn Aymara or Quechua. They learn about their indigenous culture and their language, even in the cities. Um, I remember being at a cafe on the street and some parents saying, oh, what'd you learn today? And they were counting in Quechua. And I just thought, wow, this, I would not have seen this when I was here before. Um, but they definitely still struggle. Um, that salar, that, that um, salt flat that I mentioned, it's um, got a lot of lithium underneath it. And so now there's a big struggle with the a way to get those um, minerals without, in a way that helps the population as opposed to what has happened historically where the minerals are taken and people mm -hmm. don't benefit. And I, we touched on this a little bit, but in, like, in what ways for you, when we talked about invisibility, like what, in what ways for you is it like to be invisible in the United States but privileged in Bolivia? Uh, well, you know, it's funny because... Um, I could sometimes step back from and, and see the other volunteers who really stuck out. Um, and I was sometimes, especially maybe in not in my own town or, or larger towns, um, especially if it was during a time of the year when I had maybe been outside long, more and I was darker and, um, and I, I liked being able to step back into that, um, being invisible, because that was really comfortable to me. Um, it it was uncomfortable to to though when I wasn't when like in the town where I lived. If I walked down the street, everyone knew where I was going. Sometimes I would show up at the children's center and. The director would say, oh, I know you were drinking last night over on blah, blah, blah street. <laughs> I'd be like, what? How did you know that? But everybody knew everything I did. So, <laughs> Do you have like some kind of fun memories that stick with you the most? Um, or maybe some that you didn't talk about in the book? I had 
that woman that I was so that I was good friends with, um, she and I became very close. So she started like cutting my hair. So I would go over to her house and it would become like what you do at a hair salon where, you know, you're, they're doing your hair and you're cutting and, and I got to meet her whole family. And, um, and I remember once I was sitting and watching TV with her mother and it was cartoons and she was like, are those real people on there? Is that a person in a suit or is that, what is that? And I was trying to explain in my terrible Spanish, you know, it's a drawing that's moving. And I don't, and she just kept laughing at me. Um, but <laughs> it was so wonderful to, to be able to like, not just know her from work, but to become close with her. And I would come, go to her house and she would serve me soup they often put like a chicken foot in the soup and they would just laugh at me because I would not eat the chicken soup foot <laughs> so those moments of connection mm -hmm. were what stuck with me and I like in the book like if one of my takes from it was that you, you, even though you were working at this children's center kind of the the most meaningful relationships or the most lasting relationships ended up being with the women in the in the who were at the center and in the community. Can you talk a little bit about them? It was so interesting to me. Um, so there was one young woman who, who started working there right before I did, and she was like a helper in the cook, and sh a cook's helper in the kitchen, and she was a cholita, which is um, like the traditional um, Quech Quechua skirt um, in Cochabamba, where I lived, it's short in La Paz. Um, it's longer, and they wear that bowler. But, um, and she, I remember she asked me one time, oh, should I continue to dress this way as a, as a cholita? I can't afford it, and people just think I'm an Indian. And, and I was, I thought it was strange, but then also kind of touched that she would talk to me about this. And, um, Ultimately, you know, she made the decision to stop wearing the traditional clothes. And, um, but that was her choice to make. I understand that she had choices she had to make um, to survive that I wouldn't understand. So just that those close relationships really mm -hmm. helped. And you did talk about like their dress and how it had kind of evolved over time. Like some of the clothes were traditional and then some were in a court, you know, things that were brought by kind of ex uh, because of colonialism, things were introduced over time. Yeah, like those bowler hats. Bowler that's, hats I've yeah. heard that um, British people, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that when it was, but they adopted that, they liked those hats, and so now in the pause, all the women, uh, Amara women wear that. Mm -hmm. I've not been to Bolivia, and I always see it in like, you know, their, their tourism and, you know, kind of the things you associate with Bolivia. Is it more common now to dress that way, now that they had, you know, I, I know that when they had an indigenous president, then everything sort of became more acceptable. Is it? Right. Yeah. That is one interesting thing I've, I noticed is that Maybe there's not more women wearing it on a daily basis, but in some ways it almost has become like the regalia that Native people in the U.S. use, where they'll wear it for a special ceremony, a wedding or graduation or something, but maybe on a day-to-day -day basis they dress in traditional Western wear, but mm -hmm. they've, um, I, I found that so interesting that, that they would, claim it in that way, similar to what we do. Um, but yeah, I know fewer Cholitas than I, than I did when I was there, so. How often have you been back to Bolivia since then? I've just been back a couple of just times. Couple of times. Yeah. And it has been interesting um, to go see it. Um, and also for me, you know, I, I didn't feel maybe as confident when I was there when I was younger to ask all the questions that I wanted to and actually when I went most recently I asked them about their understanding of Indian and indigenous and they all said please don't call us Indian we would prefer you call us indigenous or Quechua um, and actually it's so interesting originally I was going to call this book an Indian among 
Los Indios, and my editor, um, one of which is native, that I have two editors at the um, publisher, and they said, you know, if the Bolivians ask you not to use the word Indio, why don't you use the word indigenous? And I thought, oh, that's great, you know, people should, you should call people what they want to be called. And um, I know I prefer for people to call us natives um, or our specific tribe, and so I changed it, and I feel good about that. Would you like me to wrap it up with reading a, a section? Would that be a good way sure, to, yeah. to end? I'm going to read um, just a little bit um, before we do Q&A uh, about the, when I arrived. So this is from chapter one, A la Llegada, Upon Arrival. I arrived in La Paz as four rum and cokes joined forces with an altitude-induced headache. The other volunteers in the group had accepted the airline's complimentary drinks, and I assumed this is what people did on international flights. Now I stood in the tiny airport that teetered on the rim of the bowl-shaped valley of the city, feeling exhausted and unprepared. Wood-paneled walls didn't keep out the chilly air blowing across the high plateau. The t-shirt I had put on the night before in Miami provided no warmth. I forced myself to stand up straight despite wanting to lie down under something soft and warm. It was 7 a.m. and I was 13,000 feet above sea level. I stepped into a quickly forming line leading to a Bolivian immigration official. His pale, pockmarked face and broad, unsmiling cheeks made me wonder whether he was part Indian, native, indigenous. Bolivia had four million indigenous people. That was almost twice as many natives as in the US. In Bolivia, Indians were the majority, and I bit my lip to keep from grinning. The Bolivian official scanned passports without a greeting or a smile, quickly looking at each person's face then back at the passport. I stepped in front of the table where he sat and pulled my stiff passport out of the fanny pack my mother had given me before I left Oregon. Behind him was a shawl-sized painting of the red, yellow, and green Bolivian flag. The other volunteers shuffled toward the immigration official. I had met them only 48 hours earlier, but I already knew exactly how many brown people were in the group. It was a tally I always made. A cute Latina from Texas, a mid-career Mexicano, a bleary-eyed Puerto Rican man, an athletic Filipina from California, and a broad-shouldered Filipino who was quiet except for the occasional self-deprecating joke. I didn't like the term minority, but in this case, we were. The remaining 20 volunteers looked like those combination of Western and Eastern European identities that qualify as white in the United States. Did anybody wonder what I was? My dark brown hair and olive skin gave me a vaguely ethnic look. Teachers and curious grocery clerks usually guessed Hispanic or maybe Greek. My identity was a tailless donkey they had to pin the right kind of brown to. The immigration official looked up at my face and then down at my passport. I was excited to be standing in front of a Bolivian for the first time, but the formality of the moment made me nervous. His thick brown eyebrows moved up and down as he scrutinized me. Then he stamped it, handed it back to me, and reached for the next one. That wasn't what I had expected. Thank you for coming to my country. I can tell you are more serious than any of these gringos, <laughs> said no one. I looked around at the other officials. Didn't my sincerity show through my olive skin? Maybe it was too early in the morning. Maybe they were rushed. I waited an extra moment to give him a chance for a second look or a nod of his head. Certainly the Bolivians would eventually recognized that I was different from the others arriving from the United States that day. They would see that because I was an American Indian, we shared a connection. Coming to a country like Bolivia, a country full of native people, had been the secret wish held in my heart as I filled in the spaces on the Peace Corps application. Couldn't they see that my commitment and my meaning was more meaningful because I was native? The person behind me sighed and I reluctantly moved forward.
Kim and Ursula, thank you for such an engaging conversation. So thinking of the, the Aymara and the Quechua, um, how similar were their cultures, or, or could you tell? And um, how would you describe the relationship between those two different groups and perhaps others? You know, the Aymara and Quechua are very similar. I mean, the languages even are, are similar, um, and the dress is similar. But the Aymara are actually more powerful in some ways because um, they are in um, the president was uh, that the indigenous president was Aymara um, and they are in El Alto which is this enormous city right outside of La Paz so I I think just in terms of of power um, and their numbers um, they they are more powerful and I think that there is sometimes um, tension between the two groups. And then the other tribes, I mean, there are tribes that, uh, like the Guarani, are down um, near the border with Paraguay. And, there's, and I think that they are, less, um, they are less Bolivian and more. They're all through that whole area. And so I think that it, there is similarities but there's enough differences that there um, there's tension so so this question uh, kind of uh, ricochets off, off of something Kim uh, raised mm -hmm. earlier um, it sounded like you kind of got parachuted into a, a blank slate in terms of you know what you're there to do or, or how much um, direction or continuity there was or was somebody the next person going to be <laughs> dropped in the middle of of somewhere without much direction. Uh, I think that's a that's a good question, and I think that there was nobody who followed me in my site, but I had followed someone. Um, there was a woman um, who had completely different skill set than me. She was a um, she had an accounting background, and she was at that children's center, and she applied for a grant. They got a grant, and then she left, and it was me. And, but I think it's really common, even when someone follows someone, to end up in a place where they, they either do something different or they have to figure it out. I mean, I think that that's part of the whole thing. They, they want us to figure it out, but, um, but sometimes um, that's, that, that's really challenging and... and but it's not always that way. Other people walked into very uh, clear jobs. Could, could you tell that language really informed culture as much as culture informed language? Or did you see a big relationship between those two things? Well, um, I guess how I would answer that is I know how language informs my culture, how um, I've seen how that for me is a connection between me and, um, or was a connection between me and my grandmother. Like that was the primary way um, that she, one of the primary ways that she taught me about our Keruk culture is um, language and then stories around that language and, um, or specific words and how, and I just know when I was in Bolivia, I loved learning an indigenous language. I mean, to me, it was so different than any Latin-based language. And it was, and I knew how important it was because I knew in my own tribe, you know, there were fewer speakers each year. And, and so it felt exciting to learn, to be part of that effort. And then as, as far as culture, and language in Bolivia, it's even more um, important because that is how they determine. I've seen s some um, reports that say that is how they determine how many Quechuas there are, is who speaks Quechua, either primarily or in their house or, or grew up speaking it. So that is how, um, in parts of Bolivia, they count that as you are a member of that tribe, you speak the language. So. Um, yeah, that's... Did you have a chance to either participate or um, observe any of the indigenous spiritual practices while you were there? Um, well, 
One thing that's important in Bolivia that um, is Pachamama, like that's what they call Earth Mother. I, that's kind of not a great translation because she's much more um, kind of badass than like some kind of hippie idea of a of a Earth Mother. But um, one thing that I would see at every single um, event that we would have is they would give um, supplications, they would, they would give things to Mother Earth, they would burn um, like incense, not exactly the same as incense, and so little things like that. But as far as um, their, I don't know, it's so con interwoven with the Catholic Church, um, all of the activities I, I saw um, were, there's this incorporation of indigenous symbolism into the Catholic um, churches there. So not, not in a specific way attending something, some event. Could you expand a little bit on the early stages of working with children? And when they met you, children tend to have fewer filters than adults. So what was that like? So the, first of all, the Children's Center was about 100 kids, ranging from like six years old to high schoolers. And most of them were not orphans. When I first went there, I was told it was an orphanage. But actually, that was a mistranslation. It was more like a, a home for kids who were from, were low income or were from like a region outside of town where they didn't have schools. So they would come and stay at this, at this home, uh, children's home. Um, and they were, I mean, it, it was for me wonderful to be working with kids, even though initially I was like, oh, I'm too important to do this. But I really <laughs> liked it. I was able to connect with them because of my experience. Um, and so I, I just, I remember um, soon after I arrived, there was an eclipse, and they didn't have any glasses. They would develop these, you know, how you take a cardboard and you can cut a hole, and they would watch it. And I, Peace Corps, had given me um, sun, uh, those eclipse glasses. And so I, it was an opportunity for me to share that with the kids and, and let them look at the eclipse. Um, and so I think that was a good way and, and I would eat with them I would eat my meals with them I specifically wanted to show them you know to, to be with them um, as much as possible to just break down any barriers having been a Peace Corps volunteer myself oh. what took you the longest to adjust to that surprised you and what did you adjust to quickly that you were also surprised at that thing that we were talking about earlier that everybody knew who you were in your town and you walked down the street and everybody um, would look at you and say hi to you and you know you didn't know um, you could never if you're having a bad hair day or whatever it didn't matter everybody yeah and as you know um, and I think just quickly it, it was that there was a familiarity I had with um, the women at the children's center I was able to connect with them really quickly and they would tease me which was so like culturally familiar but also just like a great I, I connected with them early and I really loved that and um, that was that was something I was grateful for. Uh, I too was a Peace Corps volunteer and I was an Indian, a real oh my Indian. Goodness. <laughs> um, uh, my um, I read your book a couple months ago. You, I thought it was very courageous to write what you did. But I'm very curious if you noticed the similarities between the aspirations of the people there and what your aspirations may have been. Did, you know, it's like the, um, we have common aspirations, but we have different ways of achieving them, which are based on the environment. Uh, you are found in? Wow, that is a amazing question. Nobody's ever asked that. And it made me immediately think of my friend Teresa that, like, 
she was a single mom and just trying to like make a career for herself or make a life for herself and um, and she received a lot of um, it was hard for her it, it wasn't really um, acceptable for her to be a single mom and yet she was able to she's done really well for herself and and got her college degree and and so I saw these same challenges that she had that my mom had that I had just trying to like get some education and get a um, make a better life for myself and um, and I think that's why that's something I saw with her and same with um, Jimenita the, the woman who changed from being a Cholita to not being a Cholita she was just um, I, I really identified with that struggle between you know wanting to make a life for yourself but feeling these pressures like you had to maybe compromise in, in ways um, to make that happen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the things you touched upon was the, uh, the value of the contributions that the Peace Corps was making, and you touched upon the fact that you questioned at times whether projects were being done that were ones that the Peace Corps thought the Bolivians needed as opposed to ones that the Bolivians felt they needed. And I know you had done all this work at the Children's Center and then one day your field supervisor came in and you had to justify everything you were doing. Do you have any sense as to whether now there's more collaboration between uh, the, the people who live in a given area and the, uh, the administrators for the Peace Corps in terms of the selections of the projects and whether or not they're really helping people as much as they might be able to? From what I've read, I think that there has been. Um, I, I know during COVID, all the volunteers came back to the U.S. and the Peace Corps did a really big reevaluation of their approach to everything from recruiting um, to placing volunteers. So, I mean, I've read some things that make me think there was, there was more um, involvement. But as somebody who did like community development after Peace Corps, I see that happen also in US project as well, where somebody thinks this is what's important, this is what we need, and, and they're told this is what you need to do, and it's not always, it doesn't always involve the voices of the, of the folks who are gonna be most impacted. Uh, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Ursula. Thank you. <laughs>and I hope you check out our website. We have many more indigenous programs coming up and uh, are happy to be a part of Lake Forest Native Voices. So thanks for coming out.